um, I should ask you, Jessica, are there are a lot of folks in the waiting room you're trying to pop on nope. in or? Nope. Okay. okay, terrific. So let's get started. And it's great to see everybody in their little squares. Um, I'll mention this again um, at the end and put it in the e-blast next week, but Jessica and I are gonna talk about um, shifting from the waiting room model. This was a, a suggestion by past president Tammy last night at our board meeting, uh, move away from the waiting room model to having a passcode that you guys, when you when you go in to connect to the launch the meeting, you just add the passcode and then you're in the meeting and that frees Jessica up for our um, our little uh, breakout rooms as well as when it's time to launch the meeting, um, she can focus on keeping keeping me on track <laughs> and getting and get and getting folks' faces on the screen. So so more on that. So Jessica, if you want to fly the flag for us, sure thing. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right. And Allison, I'm sorry, are you our invocation today? I didn't get it in my notes, right? I am. Oh, Renee, you are. Thank you, Renee. <laughs> so I handed up, I knew that wasn't right, but. Um, no okay. surprise, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're good. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Okay. Renee. Well, it's spring. The flowers are blooming and the leaves are budding out on the trees. And it's a season of hope. And vaccines are readily available. And it seems even more a season of hope this year after an unusually long and hard year since our last spring with a pandemic to separate us, political and racial unrest wildfires, ice storms, but our club members have been bringing hope through it all. Helping to feed those who lost employment, providing protective gear and meals to frontline workers, bringing a bit of cheer to those who are isolated. In some cases, educating our grandchildren, speaking a positive unifying word when it was called for, continuing our good work of bringing water to villages in Haiti, funding our local traditional projects, providing local wildfire relief, and staying the course for our centennial project gift to the community, the Jerry Frank Salem Rotary Amphitheater nearing completion, to name just a few. As Russ Monk shared his philosophy with us last week, we are either adding to the pile or we are taking from the pile and Rotarians are definitely adding to the pile. We have been, we are, and we will continue to be agents of hope. Thank you. Great, thank you, Renee. <clears throat> All righty. Apologies. Um, so then let's go to um, any guests. And I know, Allison, you have um, several guests with you today. I do, President Sue and fellow Rotarians, Allison Kelly with Liberty House. And it is my honor to welcome Vincenzo Maturi as a guest for the last time because we'll do his swearing in today. And I'm also honored to welcome Jonathan Partridge, who is the Community Engagement Director for Liberty House. Great, thank you both for joining us today. It's great to see you and see more of you to come. Um, are there any other guests? If you can raise, raise your hand or pop something in the chat. All righty. Uh, then, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up again. And Allison, are you uh, bell ringers today? I am not. I think it's You're Dale. Dale. Today. It is Dale. I'm yep. okay. Yep, I knew that Dale. I apologize. <laughs> it's not but just for the record, I'm always happy to pitch in. <laughs> <laughs> and he's even sending me notes. That's the problem. He's sending me notes about bell ringers. Anyway. Go for no it. No problem. Dale. So we've got uh, two bell ringers and then one from the floor. 
so far. Uh, so just a reminder, I linked uh, in our chat the Rotary Club website where you can go to um, pay for your bell ringers. And the first bell ringer um, is from uh, Iria Nishimura. Uh, and I'm going to actually share my screen if I can, because she has an actual, there we go. Okay. Uh, Mother's Day is coming up soon. And have you thought about what you would like to give to the mothers in your life? Willamette Valley Hospice has a jewelry sale to raise funds for the Hospice Music Therapy Program on Saturday, May 1st, uh, from 1 to 5 p.m. The event is held in a private garden with strict COVID safety protocols in place. By registering at, and I will include the link in the chat, you will receive an invitation with the address to the private garden. Find more information at their website at wvh.org. Please ring the bell for the jewelry sale. And there is the link. The second bell ringer is from Cindy Lanasar, Community Relations Liaison with Salem Health. She would like to ring the bell for the Salem Health Community Investment Grant process, which is now open and accepting applications. The goal of the Community Investment Grant Program is to strengthen the health of our communities. Funding priorities align with the Marion Polk Community Health Improvement Plan and the needs assessment, funding efforts in the top three greatest health needs in the region behavioral and mental health, substance abuse prevention, and social determinants of health with a priority in housing and access to health care. Any 501c3 organization serving in the Marion and Polk counties can apply, and awards are for one year of funding up to $30,000 per grant. Applications opened on April 5th, and the deadline to apply is May 7th. Go to SalemHealth.org for more details and application forms please ring the bell. And from the floor, we have Allison Kelly. Thank you, Dale. Um, everybody again, Allison Kelly, Liberty House. And I am excited to again invite you to visit the Liberty House website and buy your ticket or tickets to the mega raffle. We have over 200 super exciting prizes. And we are very excited. There will be a live stream drawing on May 6th featuring Jonathan and yours truly and some other exciting people live from the Allied Video Studios. Um, Liberty House saw almost 700 children in its clinic last year, almost 400 children in its therapy program. We are working hard to add value to the community. And so it's an amazing investment. Go onto the website, buy your tickets and be prepared to win something. All right, thank you very much. Is there... Uh, thank you. And Cindy also just linked for this, uh, the Salem Health grant uh, in the chat. So if anyone has any other bell ringers, please chime in. Sounds like we're good to go. Good to go. Okay. Thank you, Dale, very much. And thank you all for your bell ringers. Uh, okay. Um, any, I don't see any other announcements, um, but uh, just a reminder that tonight is a fireside. Uh, Teresa Lule dropped a note out to all members um, earlier this week, and it is also uh, listed in the e-blast that Pam Lawson sent out yesterday. So be watching for that. And we have a lot of new members over the last few months, so it would be great um, for both tenured and the new members to join us tonight to get better acquainted. All right, Vincenzo and Allison, let's um, let's induct our newest member. Awesome. <laughs> Go, Vincenzo. Thank you. Thank you, President Sue. Well, again, President Sue and fellow Rotarians, it is my honor to present to you for membership Vincenzo Maduri. Um, I happen to have known Vincenzo since he was probably about eight. And so that is kind of a fun background that we share. A Salem native, Vincenzo attended Queen of Peace Elementary School, Crossler Middle School, and graduated from Sprague High School in 2007. Following his siblings' footsteps, Vincenzo started as a soccer player, but his artistic inclinations led him to break from the family tradition 
and focus entirely on music and drama. Through theater and choir, Vincenzo began to find his tribe and a new sense of belonging. After high school, Vincenzo continued his studies at Elon University in North Carolina, where he earned his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Music Theater in 2011. During his time at Elon, Vincenzo had the opportunity to work at various regional theaters throughout the country where he began to expand his passion for directing, educating, and melding professional and educational theater. After college, as many do, Vincenzo moved to New York City to live, learn, and pursue a career in the arts. However, after nearly two years, he decided that if Broadway was not the goal he once had aspired to, what exactly was keeping him in New York and away from his ever-expanding family? He made the decision to move back to his beloved hometown to bring his artistic knowledge, passion for theater education, and array of professional connections to our community. Enlightened Theatrics was founded in February of 2013, and that July produced its first professional production, Once on This Island. Vincenzo chose this musical specifically because of its message of the importance of community and storytelling. Not long after completing Once on This Island, Vincenzo connected with a local Broadway producer, Brisa Trinchero, whom he befriended and began to consult with to make Enlightened Theatrics the best organization it could be. While they were both visiting New York, Brisa asked if Vincenzo would be interested in staying a bit longer to help open up a new Broadway show she and her colleagues were producing, A Night with Janice Jop Joplin. Embarrassingly, Vincenzo did not actually know who Janice Joplin was, but he jumped on the opportunity to work as a production assistant on Broadway and soon thereafter began his obsession with the Queen of Rock. It goes to show when you follow your heart, you never know where it will take you. Since 2013, Enlightened has produced 20 professional productions, 25 educational productions and camps, and a dozen master classes with industry professionals. When the pandemic hit, Enlightened Theatrics knew it was their duty to provide educational outreach to students in Salem and the surrounding area by delivering safe, distanced, and meaningful performance opportunities. During the summer of 2020, they were able to facilitate an in-person day camp that served 58 students, all while maintaining social distancing and adhering to the guidelines set forth by the state. Enlightened Theatrics is continuing this practice in 2021 by providing four full-scale educational productions in the upcoming year that are available for streaming, including an adaptation of Snow White featuring elementary kiddos that will be streaming on demand from April 16th to the 25th. Enlightened Theatrics believes that socioeconomic hardships should not be a barrier in participating with Enlightened. Scholarship students are selected on a need basis and they leave at least 25% of registration reserved for full and partial scholarships. The values of Enlightened Theatrics are empathy, collaboration, accessibility, imagination, tolerance, training, and mindfulness. Vincenzo understands the power of collaboration and carries that value into the various positions he holds in the community. He currently sits as the vice president of the Salem Theater Network and is a proud member of the Liberty House Board of Directors, as well as the Downtown Advisory Board. Vincenzo has served on the Liberty House board for five and a half years, and I can tell you he and I have had many sessions in my conference room brainstorming, marketing, and amazing things, and responsible for our current slogan, Change Hurt into Hope. Um, he also works each year with the Boys and Girls Club's Youth of the Year to finesse their public speaking through storytelling. Off the clock, you can find Vincenzo belting out copious amounts of varied music, playing and hanging out with his 19 nieces and nephews and finding any excuse to visit the Oregon coast. Vincenzo would like to thank Rotary for including him and looks forward to connecting with more people and organizations through this amazing group. Great, President thank you, Sue, back to you. Absolutely, Vincenzo, we're so excited to have you as a part of our uh, Rotary Club. So first off, thank you, Allison, for introducing Vincenzo Maduri into our membership. Recognizing folks that will, will continue to build this great club and bringing them on board is very important to our livelihood. To show our appreciation, the club will award you, Allison, with 250 Paul Harris points towards your next fellowship. Vincenzo, through your membership in Rotary, you can build lifelong friendships and join forces with like-minded people around the world who desire to make a difference in their communities. Our club is made up of leaders and potential leaders who are inspired by the motto, Serve, service above self, and you show that through your, your work and deeds throughout our community. As Rotarians, we have all pledged to uphold the highest ethical standards, subscribe to the object of Rotary, and live by the four-way test. 
Regular attendance at our weekly meetings is an important part of your membership, but Rotary is much more than just a lunch club. As you become more involved in our club, you will begin to understand the power of Rotary through expanded friendships and involvement in your choice of the many committees that we offer. As you build those friendships and con contribute to our impact here and around the world, you will truly understand what it means to be a member of this club and one of over 1.2 million Rotarians wor worldwide. We are a vibrant action-oriented club and as such, we expect you to roll up your sleeves and get involved. Therefore, Vincenzo, as the newest member of our club, do you pledge to uphold the four-way test, to serve on at least two committees and to contribute to the club in every way you can? I do. <laughs> okay, <laughs> excellent. And fellow Rotarians, do you pledge to warmly welcome Vincenzo into our club and to offer his full and, and offer him your full support in all that we do. We do. We do. We do. We do. So welcome Vincenzo Thank as the world's you. newest Rotarian. Woo. Super excited. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank and you thank all you. so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, looking forward to it. And um, I have to say too, I, I appreciate your help with, I should do a bell ringer. Um, um, I appreciate your help, but I will do a bell ringer for Vincenzo. Um, helping our teens through our Youth of the Year program, especially this year, the kids are presenting their speeches virtually. And just look at me, I'm struggling every single day when I'm talking with you all about um, professionally presenting and um, speaking in front of a screen. And um, Vincenzo, the kids so, the teens so look forward to having Vincenzo come in and work with them. Staff are so psyched when we know that he's coming in the building. And then um, so many opportunities for our our kids through Enlightened Theatrics and the educational theater that you put on has really changed lives for many, many of my kids. So I'm very grateful. Thank you, sir. That's for you. <laughs> All righty, that was fun. So we are off to our program. So I'd like to introduce John McCauley as our program chair um, and introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, John. Thank you, President Sue, uh, fellow Rotarians. It's uh, my honor today to present the program. And I've uh, been a member of this club for a while and I understand there's a real interest in, in wine in this club, among other spirits, but wine in particular. So I think our speaker today is going to be well uh, received. Uh, before introducing our speaker, I would like to introduce the head table I invited Jason Greenwood, owner of Divine Distillers, to be at the head table. I don't know if Jason is here. Jessica, do you know? I haven't seen him. I don't see him. I don't think he's here. Okay. Well, anyway, he was going to fulfill an obligation to receive his blue badge today, and unfortunately, he missed that opportunity. So, sorry, Jason. Uh, moving on, I'll introduce Susanna Owens. Um, Susanna, and also introduce John Totten. Susanna and John are the owners of Kitty Hawk Vines in South Salem. They are the growers of premium Pinot Noir grapes, and I think are familiar with our speaker today. I had invited uh, Tim Murphy to sit at the head table today. Uh, he is the uh, owner of Muddy Paws a Vineyard, uh, but Tim is out of the state and is unable to join us, but his loss. And finally, I would like to introduce uh, Pam Wasson. Um, Pam is the director of the Lord and Shriver Conservancy, but uh, I think, well, in, in addition, I th she is the, the cog that gets our weekly newsletter out and also our monthly amphigram. And I think Justice does an incredible job, but she's at the head table today because she is, as, as far as I know, the strongest advocate for women pursuing careers in horticulture. She is uh, dedicated to that uh, duty and uh, really fulfills it well. So I wanted to have Pam at the head table because I think here's my alliteration for the day. Our presenter personifies Pam's passion. And I think this is really true. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Patty Skinkus today. Patty is my neighbor. And I got to know Patty when we moved uh, here to Monmouth. And she's always been to me the um, mother of Isaac and Audrey Rose. And little did I know that she is also a wine industry superstar. Patty is the professor and viticultural extension specialist for Oregon State University. 
She uh, grew up on a dairy farm near Green Bay, Wisconsin, and holds a bachelor's degree in horticulture from uh, with University of Wisconsin Riverside, and that's a Go Falcons for those who may want to know that. She uh, then received her PhD in horticulture from Purdue University, Go Boilermakers, mm -hmm. uh, and her uh, thesis was on viticulture. She joined the OSU faculty in 2007, where she conducts applied research and provides outreach and education programs for the Oregon wine grape industry, where she has earned the highest respect. She is a core researcher as part of the Oregon Wine Institute. In addition, Patty also teaches undergraduate and graduate level viticulture courses at OSU. Uh, beyond the Oregon, she is a member of the Grapes Advisory Board of the National Clean Plant Network and is an associate editor of the American Journal of Enology and Viticulture. Uh, Patty of note is the current president of the 2400 member American Society for Enology and Viticulture. She has been recognized for her work and service and her awards include the Visionary Horticulturalist Award from the American Society for Horticultural Science. She's earned the OSU Outreach and Engagement Award and has been named Oregon's Outstanding Service Award from the Oregon Wine Board. So please join me in welcoming Patty Skankus. Thank you. That's a really nice uh, introduction, John. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, it's nice to hear recognition that I'm a mom too. Uh, so often I get so busy doing my work that um, I that a lot of the industry may not even know that I have a little ones that keep me busy on the side. Um, so today I was invited to talk to you about uh, climate change and how it's impacting the wine industry broadly, but even more specifically here in Oregon. And I think a great way to start out talking about climate change is to talk a, a bit about how we've grown as an industry here in the state. I'm sure many of you are aware we have a wine industry um, and it's a, a quite a small industry on a national and an international scale, but a very large industry when it comes to importance to Oregon. So the wine grape industry in the state, we currently have over 37,000 planted acres. Now, when I came here in two, 20, or 2007, we only had uh, 15,700 acres. So we've we've more than um, more than doubled in that time. We are one of the top producing commodities in the state. We're number seven of all the commodities produced in Oregon. That includes all other products, whether it's livestock, nursery, um, we're number seven. And we are the number one fruit produced in the state. We used to be second to pears, uh, and we are, we're, we're above pears, hazelnuts, blueberries, all of those for fruit production. Uh, we are number one for the state. We have over 1,200 vineyards, and if you do the math, it's a pretty small size vineyard, and I think many of you probably are aware of that. We have many small vineyards in the state, and we have each year more vineyards being developed and more wineries. And of course, our number one variety being produced in the state is Pinot Noir, which is a cool climate grape variety, which plays into the discussion today about climate change. Now, <clears throat> Here's all the production information for Oregon acreage starting back in 1984 and where we've come to today. Now our most recent data is for 2019 and you can see we've, we've increased acreage really rapidly since 2000, the year 2000. And even in the years when we had recession in 2008 through 2010, we didn't see much of a slowdown in planting. Even in the more recent uh, years uh, where we've seen some slowdown economically, we still hear of plantings throughout the state. Of course, Pinot Noir drives uh, most of that growth throughout the state. But over time, we've had mainly the three top varieties being cool climate varieties, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, and Chardonnay are the top three, even still today. Pinot Noir, again, is the lion's share of what we produce in the state. There's a more, uh, a, a slight increase in Chardonnay more recently and a, a somewhat of a leveling off of Pinot Gris uh, being produced in the state. And again, we've more than doubled in our acreage since 2010. 
So it's not just those varieties that we grow. We grow quite a few other varieties, especially as we get outside of the Willamette Valley. There's much more diversity represented throughout warmer areas of the state. But this is just a snapshot from our last vineyard and winery report in 2019 that showed that we've seen some increases in these other varieties, which are not cool climates. So we've seen Malbec and Albarino. But the others are largely still cool climate varieties. And this is in terms of growth in planted acreage as of 2019. So about seven to 11% growth. Now, if you haven't been aware of our, our other grape growing regions in the state, we have quite a few. In fact, we are number three in terms of wine grape production throughout the United States, but we're number two in the US for having the, the highest number of AVAs, only second to California. So we have 21 American viticultural areas in the state. Those are broken down here in this, in this figure, a map of Oregon. Some of them aren't even included yet for verified American viticultural areas. And we have an additional two more that are pending to be developed. And what these are are areas within the state that are defined based on their geological characteristics that define that land as being unique for grape production. And so we're considered a cool climate state. Now, long-term production issues, we certainly have many that we can think about. And as an extension specialist, I'm always hearing about the problems and hopefully providing growers and, and winemakers with some solutions. But in the long term, here are some of the key issues that we're dealing with. Labor availability is something that's going to always be a problem. Uh, water and nutrient stress, especially with drought years, even though we are here in the Willamette Valley, we have growers who are concerned about this because we have dry farmed, largely dry farmed vineyards. They may either not have water rights or they may not have enough um, may not know how to best manage their vineyards to deal with a drier climate. Of course, when we get to other parts of the state, water and nutrient stress are much more upfront a production concern even years ago. And certainly climate change is playing into some of these long-term issues. We saw just with our wildfire situation come into the Willamette Valley last September, something that normally we're pretty isolated from in the Willamette Valley, but it's something we share with our Southern Oregon uh, industry members who have to deal with this on a much more regular basis and certainly our, in, our colleagues in California and Washington. So climate change is playing into these into these uh, situations that we're seeing. Now, this is a picture I took in Southern Oregon back in July 2018 when we did a field tour down there for the industry. And that haze you see, that's due to the wildfires that they were dealing with then. So it really can, it can dampen the sunlight, can really uh, moderate the heat, and actually impact humidity. So uh, this is just an example of some of that climate change occurring. But when we look at climate change specifically in viticulture, it really helps us get a better understanding of our limits from the vine physiology aspect. So as a horticulturist, I was trained in vine or plant physiology, and I'm really interested in knowing how we can modify what we do in vineyard production to work within the confines of what this change is going to have on the environment. So if we see shifts in temperature and rainfall, how can we deal with that? And of course, I'm not an enologist, but I certainly do a lot of research with my colleague who is an enologist. We know that there are real impacts on how we produce wine when we have grapes being produced under these changing climate conditions. So it, when it comes to the viticulture aspect, looking at how climate change is impacting what we do, certainly grape growing is the two most important factors are our soils and our climate and how the plant interacts with these 
uh, the soil conditions and our climate conditions is really important. What are the vines doing? How are they responding? And once we know how they're responding, we can design better management practices to deal with that. And that's really where I fit in into the equation in the, in the research and the education for the wine industry in Oregon is understanding that and hopefully developing some new ways of looking how to manage vineyards, looking at managing vineyards with these changes. But first, especially for those of you who aren't aware of what grapevines need, I want to just talk a little bit about what grapevines need to produce a viable crop. And there's a pretty wide definition of this. And when I teach in viticulture, students get really upset with me because they're like, we just want to know the ABCs of what we need to do. But it all depends. And generally speaking, we need a moderate growing conditions. We need warm days and cool nights. We need dry seasonal weather to avoid disease concerns. The cool nights is important to berry development and uh, I should specifically say berry quality development of some of the aroma and color compounds. We need a season length that's long enough to ripen the fruit. So if you've got frost concerns, we need to have at least 180 or 200 frost-free days to do that for most grapevine cultivars. And we need sufficient heat units. If a, a region is too cool uh, and doesn't have enough accumulated heat during that entire season, it cannot grow grapes. So uh, growing degree days are a way that we, we basically summarize thermal time and we look at how much heat is gained over time. Soils are important, but they're not the most important, even though that's the number one question I get from people who want to establish new vineyards. They'll say, I, I've got a property. I want to know if the soils are good. I'll say, let's back up. What's your elevation? What's your slope? All these other aspects that will impact the climate of that specific site. Of course, water is important. And this is really key for a lot of people because they think that grapevines don't really need that much water and that you want to stress them. But stress is good only to a point. So all of these are very general characteristics for grapes and they really depends on the cultivar and that's a good thing when we're talking about climate change. The most important thing that determines whether we can uh, effectively grow grapes is the climate and matching the cultivar with the climate. So we'll take a step back in time and this will give us a, an idea of how important climate change uh, or how important grapevines are in dealing with climate change. And that's because grapevines are a temperate fruit crop. That means they do need a winter and they are, however, very widely adapted. And this is because they, although they gener were uh, originating from the Fertile Crescent, they were basically a currency that was used for uh, distribution of grapevines over time. It was a currency of trade. And so we saw a lot of movement of grapevines into Europe. They're easy to propagate. You can take a dormant cutting and easily propagate them. This is what led to them being planted all over Europe, Northern Africa, all over Asia, and uh, into, of course, the, the Middle, Middle East. And there's one main species that's being most widely distributed, and that's Vitis vinifera. And that's considered the European wine grape, although it originated in the Middle East. Now, there are more than 13,000 cultivars or varieties of Vitis vinifera. So over that time of all that distribution, we were able to you know, select the best varieties that fit for a given region. And that's how we were able to come up with many different cultivars suited to cool or warm or hot climates. So when we're talking about variety or cultivar, we use that term interchangeably. That's basically usually what you see on the wine label. So when you see Pinot Noir or Chardonnay, that's the variety that was grown in the vineyard. Um, again, these are all grown in temperate climates. There are some exceptions to the rule that these are grown in tropical areas, but typically, what, naturally, they would grow in temperate climates. Now, I talked about thermal time being important for matching grapevine cultivars, and here's just a breakdown of what the seasonal cumulative growing degree days need to be for matching the variety uh, to a different climate given climate. So in Oregon, we're largely in that cool climate zone of less than 2,500 heat units. And you can see the cool climate cultivars shown there. So things you think of that you see typically Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, 
those are all cool climate. But then when you think of California or Washington, you think about um, different varieties. That's because they need a longer and hotter growing season to ripen that we don't, we can't, we can't physically do it here. If we grow Merlot, it's going to taste like green beans because we don't have enough heat units uh, to ripen it. And of course, as you get hotter, that's when we see table grape varieties and some other, you know, raisins and getting into the, the hottest climate uh, wine grape varieties. So it's about matching climate uh, or cultivar to climate. And lucky for us, Oregon is in the coolest of those climate regions. So there's the Winkler classes. This is this, this is a way that we as viticulturists will characterize the heat units of a region and then be able to pair those cultivars. And Oregon is in only Winkler, Winkler class number one and two. And you can see some of the comparators there for California and Washington. That would be our equivalent. So we have room to grow down in if we get warmer into other uh, groupings of cultivars, some of the warmest areas, that's where we see the biggest concern for climate change, making those areas less suited to growing grapes. So here's the distribution of heat units across the, the state of Oregon. This is based on long-term growing degree days or uh, that thermal time data. Typically, we're, we're well under 2,500 heat units in the Willamette Valley. In the early days of the industry, they were really concerned about even getting cool climate varieties ripe. Um, in more recent years, we've seen that shift up. As we get into Southern Oregon uh, along the gorge and into the Walla Walla Valley, we see that we are getting closer to that almost 3000 uh, heat unit mark to be able to grow those warmer climate Bordeaux varieties. And we see more Cabernet Sauvignon, more, more low and Syrah being grown there. Now, in terms of the factors of climate change, there's been a number of studies done to anticipate or project what we think climate change will do to vineyards in particular. And certainly there's been commentary on solar radiation and increasing CO2, but the most important impact has been on temperature. Really the impact on how the season length is gonna be changing, how those average temperatures are going to affect grape growing, extreme heat and cold events, and also the risk of frost actually changing. So I'm going to focus on that specifically. And what some of the projections have been in the in the literature is that we would have a severe reduction of major regions producing grapes by about 81%. And specifically, when we look at premium wine grape production, that reduction is by 20%. So we're looking at very much more restricted grape growing criteria for those premium wine growing regions. And the biggest concern about that climate change, because we have a lot of flexibility in what cultivars we can grow, the biggest concern is the fruit production in, the, in light of hotter temperatures impacting the quality. And the fact that most of the regions still want to grow the same variety that they've always grown because it's important to their identity, it's important to their marketing, it's what people expect from those regions. So that's what those two uh, points above are referring to, kind of what our expected outcome of a region is. It's not taking into account adjustments. Uh, also the lack of water, just especially in their driest regions of uh, production in the Pacific Northwest and uh, West Coast, that's one of the biggest concerns as well as uh, worldwide. So this visual uh, heat map shows you where we can, we see a shift in land that is suitable for growing grapes. If we go from the left to the right from the past, where our grape growing regions were in those Winkler classes, the warmer is the red and the cooler is the white uh, and the blue. We see that the blue regions in Oregon are actually growing bigger as we get warmer. So as we see climate change increasing, we see that areas of the Pacific Northwest are actually growing in potential for grape production. And we see the potential areas for grape production in California decreasing. And that's because of their typical grape growing areas are going to decrease by that 81%. And we are already seeing some companies out of California starting to buy properties in Oregon and Washington, likely because they're concerned about the longevity of their industry uh, down in California. 
And when we look at some of the data that's also available on what water is doing, not just with temperature, but what are the changes in, in our, our hydrologic cycle, so the water cycle over the past 70 years, we can see that we do see some real change uh, in especially the West Coast. We see that we are getting a, a, a shift in our, our water cycle and a reduction in the amount of water, but also higher amount of variability. So red is drier, blue is wetter, and that's going to have a major impact uh, likely moving forward. And certainly water is uh, a major concern on the, in the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast, not only because of the availability of water, but also the quality. We know that irrigation demands are going, going to increase with increasing heat, uh, but we also know that when we decrease the amount of water we use, there can often be soil salinity issues, also water quality issues, especially for the most arid regions of, 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 the, of the West Coast. Now, how do these climate changes, uh, changes the climate really impact the wine industry? Well, I'm gonna look at it from three different perspectives. Certainly there's the vineyard. The biggest impact there is going to be on how the vines are growing. It's going to affect the yield if they don't get water at certain times of year. We can actually see poor fruit set if they're water stressed early in the season. We also see higher amounts of water being used. We can see impacts on fruit ripening that I'll go into a little bit more. That impact on the fruit will definitely impact the winery. So the condition of the fruit is going to dictate how they're going to work with that fruit, whether they'll have to make different amendments, how they'll have to process that, and what kind of wine style will come out. And really, it fundamentally will change how they make wine. And of course, when you have a shift in your wine style, then you're always concerned about the sales. You know, is that going to be something that your people are going to be used to? You know, 10 years ago, they started talking about high alcohol wines. Um, was And that became a concern because we had high alcohol, because we had warmer temperatures, we had higher sugars. And that was less of a concern here in Oregon, more of a concern in California and warm areas such as Australia. And eventually the market moved with that that. Um, but there's another concern with the marketing and sales is that if you change varieties that people are not used to, there can be that impact uh, and concern. So that's a very real concern for the wine grape industry is they don't want to start growing something that's adapted to climate change if people don't want to drink it or are largely unaware of it. So now I'm going to take it back to uh, kind of current day, you know, where we are in the Willamette Valley and whether we've seen any major shifts. Well, this is the heat unit, that thermal time uh, from April to October, which is our typical growing season for the last 20 plus years. And what we've seen is that over the last 10 years, we have had some of the, the, the coolest season and the warmest season in this in the last 20 in the last 10 years so what we see is more climate variability we do see a general warming but it's not drastic it's not you know you know it's it's very gradual and so when i dissected the data by decade and went from 1999 to 2009 and 2010 to 2020 we see that we have about a 200 uh, degree day increase in the last 10 years and our variability, the standard deviation is greater than it was the 10 years prior. And that seems pretty minor, but it actually makes a big difference with what it, how it impacts grapevine growth and how we do things in the vineyard. Now, in terms of rainfall, we don't see as much of a, a difference in rainfall there. It's harder to dissect a, a big difference, but we do see some more variability. So our mean is about the same for the past two decades. If we consider 1999 uh, to 2009 or 2010 to 2020, we see about you know similar mean annual rainfall, but we see some more variability occurring across those years. Now, in the Willamette Valley, we, we have a, a certain way we do things, especially when we grow grapes. We've got our, our uh, seem, seemingly rote ways of managing our, our nutrition, our canopy management. And so we, we get used to doing things at a certain time. So in our normal situation, we have our irrigation, our fertilization, our pest management, our canopy management, and that happens on a certain timeline. We get done with the growing season around middle of uh, September to middle of October, depending on the site. And there is key phenological stages or growth stages that occur at those times. And there's certain rainfall, certain temperatures that occur at that time. 
And what we've seen with some climate changes, there's a shift in how people are responding to the environment that we have. So one of the things that a lot of the industry started doing when I came to Oregon was more leaf pulling. We were advocating more leaf pulling in our very high density vineyards to expose uh, flowers and clusters early so that they could uh, reduce disease incidence and help with berry development and specifically helping with increased uh, color. We typically didn't have a lot of color in our Pinot Noirs because they are cool climate Pinot Noir. And what we've seen, you know, early on, I did a number of research studies that showed the industry increase your leaf pulling, you'll get better color development and better wine quality. Well, then we saw that the industry stopped pulling as many leaves because they felt it was getting too warm. They didn't want sunburn, but even still studies I've done more recently, even under our warmer conditions, show that this is an example of a study I did in 2018 and 2019 of Pinot Noir fruit that had been exposed completely since bloom. So early June to harvest looked beautiful, wasn't sunburned at all. And what we found was we'd get this, this kind of sunburning on the left hand side, those green berries are burned because they weren't pulling enough leaves. They thought they had to stop because it was getting warmer to them. And the berries then were not acclimated properly by the time we got our heat spikes in August. Um, so that's one factor we see that people are almost jumping the gun a little too much and doing their practices a little later than they normally would when we have these warm conditions occur. The other thing that we've seen that's a little puzzling to us is something called uh, water berry or berry shrivel, where the berries don't fully ripen and they become flaccid, they're kind of uh, deflated. And we believe that has to do with some sunburn and heat issues that occur in August, that the vines can't keep up with the heat demand on very isolated hot days. Uh, and we aren't irrigating these vines. So we, it's a puzzle. We don't actually know the cause of this, but we do see this happening in our warmest years. So 2015, 2017, 2014 were years where we saw more of this occurring. And we think this has to do with that, that change in, in, in hotter temperatures during summer. The other problem with hotter temperatures in summer is that we no longer are bringing our fruit in in September or October for harvest. We're seeing earlier ripening into August. Now we haven't seen that a lot for our still wines. We do see that for our sparkling wines that we are getting pretty uh, much earlier harvest. And when that happens or in the future, if that happens, that really uh, impacts our fruit quality because that's when our berries are, are usually under a cooler condition of September, think September versus August, and our berries are developing their, their sugars, their acids, their color compounds, all which have a very tight link to temperature and sunlight exposure. And so when we've had high temperature, not necessarily here in the Willamette Valley, but in other regions with increasing uh, seasonal temperatures, as well as the um, earlier ripening, we see higher sugars or bricks, which leads to higher alcohol wines, which can be a problem for some of the quality aspects. Low acids become a problem with stability and, and you get microbial spoilage of wines much easier. There's often less color. So while we can use heat and light to increase color, there's a threshold that if you have too much heat and too much sunlight, we see a degradation of the amount of color, purple pigments in red grapes. We also see higher phenolics developing in white grapes. We, we like those in red grapes, but in white grapes, it leads to bitter uh, flavors and mouthfeels. Uh, so we don't want that in white grapes. We also see that the berries somewhat have this uh, increase in sugars that make us then go and harvest. But then we what's lagging behind is the aroma development. So we see unripe aroma and flavors, but we're at the right benchmark for our sugars and acids. And of course, we also see sunburn and shrivel. Well, when you have these impacts on the fruit, then the fruit coming into the winery leads to issues that the winemakers have to deal with. And that could be high sugars or low acids. And that's the biggest problem we see right now because they're waiting for ripe aromas to develop, but at the same time, their sugars are just going through the roof, aka usually the berries are dehydrating. We also see that lower uh, color development. So at the winery, they have to make changes to how they handle that fruit, or they will have to change how they're doing things in the vineyard to hopefully hold off the ripening of that fruit, which is not so easy. So how do they deal with this? Well, the easiest 
thing to, for me to say is, you know, consider different sites for your development or change your cultivars or use different rootstocks, all of which can help change what they're currently doing. But that doesn't help somebody who's got a, an investment of a long-term vineyard development. There it's a perennial crop. You can't easily do that. You can't change on a dime. So we've looked at vineyard management techniques to help deal with what we are given especially when we might have this climate variability where you don't wanna put all your eggs in a basket and choose to do a new uh, cultivar if it's still a marginal zone for growing that grape. So there's a couple different things. First of all, irrigation. Uh, that is one that we found a lot of growers haven't been using the best techniques that they could. And so they'll have to go through and do what's called evapotranspiration scheduling. So ET scheduling of their irrigation. We have a lot of uh, outreach and extension work just to get the growers to understand how to do that. And in a drought year like this year is one that we're taking every opportunity to teach them about that. Also having them convert to drip irrigation. Mostly growers in Oregon are doing that, but in other places, they're not doing that as much. Also vineyard design rootstocks. We have a trial at, at our OSU vineyard where we're doing a trial on rootstocks that my predecessor planted in 1997. We're gathering data off that right now to be able to help growers make better decisions when they plant new vineyards. And so we have that across a couple of different cultivars. We also have seen growers and recommended to growers that they change their training system. So instead of it being a perfect hedgerow, we said don't tuck those, those shoots on the, on the west side if you are concerned about sunburn, leave them untucked if you've got the room or leave a really messy VSP. Don't hedge it as much as, as in the picture on the left. We also have seen us uh, shifting back to some hanging systems, not so much here in Oregon, uh, but down in California to provide shading uh, to the fruit so that it's not being uh, directly uh, hit by the sun. Also lower planting densities have also helped. So these climate change will basically pressure uh, producers to adapt. We see that occurring on an annual basis when we, we hear about the drought monitor that growers are then uh, wondering what they should do when we help them out by providing education and resources uh, for them to start changing, providing or doing some of that change. But in Oregon, we're still pretty lucky because we're in a cool climate area and we have a lot of growth potential. We've seen that with new investment from outside of the state. Um, we, we also have a lot more cultivars and rootstocks that we could use to allow for that adaptation, but it all requires time and investment. So hopefully I didn't go too much over time and, and I'd be happy to address any questions uh, if people have questions. Terrific, um, Patty, this is Sue. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll, um, we'll watch the chat and um, I know there'll be questions. <laughs> So Linda, do you want to ask your question? Would you please ask your question? <laughs> okay, sure. Um, I had the privilege of being able to visit Bordeaux um, a year ago or so when my daughter was there. And what I learned in Bordeaux is that all the chateaus and you know um, they have their own unique variety of cultivars and they um, all the chateaus um, have unique blends of different um, cultivars. And I, I know in, in Willamette Valley here, it seems like there's not as much variety of blends. It's like we have a Pinot Noir, we have a you know, um, Chardonnay or, and, and I was just kind of curious if maybe more diversity in the varieties and blending the cultivars would be a, a possible solution, like you were saying, helping to adapt to the climate change stuff. Yeah, certainly right now, why we see a very limited varieties offered is because of our growing region. So if they want to grow only Oregon, they're going to have made or growing mainly for that that AVA, they're going to have a limitation because we're a cool climate region. So they're largely uh, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, and there's not a lot of blending that is typically done with Pinot Noir. Um, the blends tend to be more typical with Bordeaux varieties. So um, that, that's much more common. So the, the red blends, and interestingly, red blends are much more popular today uh, with the wine drinking public and the consumer than uh, ver single varieties. Very good. Um, Patty, Ron Kellerman's wondering the topic of your PhD. 
um, well, I worked with a, a Gewurztraminer hybrid. Uh, in the state of Indiana, they couldn't grow Vitis vinifera very well because of the cold winters. And so uh, there was a new, a new hybrid at the time called Traminet that was being grown and they needed to know how to grow it well. And so I did a vine to wine thesis that looked at training systems and canopy management to improve monoterpene development, which is aroma compounds essentially, to increase the wine quality. And so I did the field-based studies and then carried it through winemaking and sensory and showed that yes, if they did certain um, canopy management techniques that could improve the aroma compounds in that. And it smells basically like a, a Gewurztraminer. Wonderful. And then Elise, do you, would you like to ask your question? Well, you can, you can see it there, Patty. Yeah. So uh, the question was, are there are many table grapes grown in Oregon. Um, there are not many. There's a, there is a market for it. The, those, as I understand, most of the table grape growers are actually small fruit growers, so berry, berry growers, not grape growers. And they typically are selling either to you know, small markets or uh, farm markets. So there is actually a table grape variety trial at the North Willamette Research and Extension Center. And that's not led by me, but by Bernadine Strick, our berry specialist. So there is a uh, we have mostly the Arkansas varieties in that trial. And that was John Clark out of uh, University of Arkansas. He did a lot of selecting for table grapes that would be much more suitable for Oregon than the other typical grapes, table oh, grapes. Interesting. Ron, Ron, do you want to ask your question? Um, when we were uh, bicycling through southern France a few years ago, it seemed like all the vines were just very bushy and unkept. And I'm kind of wondering, uh, were they lazy or are they just ahead of the times compared to our highly manicured vines here? Uh, that's a good question. My guess is that they were uh, head trained vines. So there's uh, there's head trained vines that are called bush, bush trained vine. And so they look like a little tree rather than in a hedge system. So my guess is they did, they, that was the training system. And part of the reason they do that is because of the shade. So they don't wanna necessarily have high heat, high exposure on those clusters, especially if it's Southern France versus Northern France. Very good. Well, Patty, we truly appreciate your presentation. It was just fascinating and, and very educational. So thank you for joining us. You're um, welcome. Yes, thank you. In your honor today, we'll make a donation to our very own Salem Rotary Foundation that supports families and children in our community. So thank you so much. And as we wrap up, um, remember to watch for in our e-blast a note about our shift from waiting rooms to passcodes. So when you log in, when you go to launch your Zoom next week, um, in the in the e-blast, you'll also have the link to the Zoom as well as a passcode you'll need to type in to get into the meeting. So as we wrap up, um, next week's program, Linda Bednars is our program chair and it will our guest will be Ray White. And uh, he'll be talking more about our furthering our journey around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So with that, I appreciate you all coming here today. It's wonderful to see you. Can't wait to be with you and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.